good afternoon, everybody. Um, today I'm uh, presenting on a research project that I completed recently, uh, assessing uh, massively parallel sequencing as an investigative, investigative tool. So the intent of the research uh, was to collaborate with Queensland Police Service, with the detectives, and they're our end users. So we wanted to collaborate with them to assess uh, the MPS. Uh, we assessed both biogeographic ancestry and hair and eye colour externally visible characteristics. And the assessment we assessed in terms of operational effectiveness. So we wanted to determine how could that MPS uh, assist a, a, a real investigation in Queensland. Uh, my intention was if we had positive findings to use the findings of this research as a justification uh, in, a, in a business case for instrument purchase and also to use this model of uh, assessing operational effectiveness with the end users as a model for assessing future panels. So what did we actually do? Uh, the extraction and DNA quantification we performed in Queensland in, in uh, our forensic labs there uh, and we travelled to Melbourne to the Thermo Fisher uh, labs to do the MPS analysis. Uh, we used the Precision ID Ancestry uh, panel, the commercial panel, and the DNA phenotyping uh, community panel. And we processed that on the uh, Ion Chef and the uh, S5XL. So what methodology did we use? We selected four real Queensland cases, and I think it's uh, it's important to, to emphasise this was deliberate because we wanted to use real Queensland cases so that our assessment was as close as possible to uh, a, a real-life situation uh, and a real investigation. We conducted MPS analysis only of the offender reference samples. We didn't process any crime scene samples because we didn't want to unnecessarily consume those. Uh, we used those results. Uh, and, and interpreted the MPS results to prepare intelligence reports, which were presented to the detectives. Uh, we collected uh, mugshot photographs of each of the offenders uh, and the, all of the POIs from the cases and their physical descriptions. And we had, for some of the, uh, some of the uh, POIs, we have multiple uh, mugshots that had been collected over, over years. And it was interesting to note that some of the physical descriptions weren't consistent with their, with their mugshots. And then we conducted workshops in person with the detectives. So as I said, we selected real cri Queensland criminal cases and we used a number of criteria to select these cases. Uh, we wanted large numbers of persons of interest because this is one of the applications of MPS to prioritise those large lists of, uh, of POIs. We wanted POIs with a range of appearances and ancestries and this is what we could use to actually prioritise that list, the differences in their appearance and ancestries. We obviously we needed a good quality photograph for each of the POIs um, and we wanted to keep things as real as possible. We wanted to have offender DNA located at the crime scene. And obviously we needed that reference sample of the offender uh, to actually process. So just, a, 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 I guess, a broad overview of the cases that we used. These are the four cases that we analysed. The first was uh, eight linked sexual offences and home invasions. We, these happened over a number of years. And for the, for the uh, I guess, the entire investigation, the, the offender was not, uh, was an unknown offender. And there was a very large number of uh, POIs investigated for that investigation. The second was 10 linked sexual offences over a shorter period of time, but still an unknown offender. Uh, the third was a murder of a female victim. Now, this only had one POI, which was the offender, but we included this case because the offender was actually identified uh, using CCTV. So we wanted to see whether the detectives could use the MPS intelligence to compare that to the CCTV imagery. And the fourth and final one was the murder of a female victim. There were eight POIs and they were from a range of ancestries. So the actual workshops, what did we do? We had 28 police detectives who participated and the the way that they flowed, we, we gave a case scenario. So we gave the background of the offence, the MO, and if there was multiple offences, we, we, gave, we gave that for each offence. Um, we gave the investigation history. So we, 
walks the detectives through what the actual process that had been conducted for the investigation of each of the cases. We gave the DNA results, so the actual DNA results that were available, and then we inserted the NPS results in the form of, the, uh, of an intelligence report. I've got one of those I can show you. Uh, then we gave the uh, detectives all of the mugshots, so the, all of the POIs and the offenders. Uh, obviously, we didn't identify who the offender was, and we asked them to use the intelligence reports to make include, exclude or unsure assessments on each of the POIs. So could those POIs be included or excluded using the intelligence reports? And we also collected... Uh, a range of other metrics which I'll describe. So this is an example of the intelligence reports that we uh, that we generated. So at the top we had some uh, just some case details, sample details, and then in the results we made two types of statements. So you can see at the bottom of the the first page of this intelligence report we made a series of likely statements. So for example, for eye colour, we said that the donor is likely to have brown eyes. On the second page, for each of the ancestry, hair colour, eye colour, we also made a series of not likely statements. So again, for eye colour, we said that the donor is not likely to have blue or intermediate eyes. And these are the statements that the uh, detectives use to assess the, uh, the photographs of each of the POIs. And you'll note that we didn't give them the raw data, the raw NPS analysis data. So the metrics that we collected that we used to assess the operational effectiveness, uh, firstly, confidence. So what was the accuracy? How did the detectives rate the accuracy and the robustness of that intelligence? And what was their willingness to use the intelligence in an investigation? We asked them to rate their value. So did they believe that the NPS intelligence had a positive or negative impact on the investigation? Would it direct it in, a, in an informative direction or would it mislead the, direct, the investigation? We assessed their population group awareness. So for the ancestry root populations, what we did was for the likely statements, uh, we asked them to use a, we gave them a map of the world and some, and some colouring in pencils and we asked them to circle the areas that they felt that were represented by the likely uh, uh, statements for the for ancestry. So if we said Europe, we asked them to colour in. If it was likely to have uh, European ancestry, we asked them to colour in those areas on the map. We looked at uh, whether the offender was included or excluded. Obviously, that's a key metric. Um, and then we looked at the percentage of POIs that were excluded. So the results. Uh, confidence. Two thirds of the of the detectives, and this is a summary of for each of the cases, um, two thirds assessed their confidence as greater than fifty percent. And this was again a measure of how they felt, how accurate and robust they thought the intelligence was, and what was their willingness to use it. So you can you can see there there was a level of confidence there that it could be used. And I, I guess I should say that all of these detectives. No, none of them had previous experience with MPS, so I would be concerned if they had a very high level of confidence in, in, in uh, MPS because of its uh, the, because its intelligence by its nature. Uh, value: so ninety percent of respondents accept it, assessed it as having positive value, which means, and we gave these descriptors on the response sheet, so they knew what they were they knew what they were saying when they assessed the value. They, they felt that the MPS provided avenues for investigation and had the potential to indicate a suspect pool. So that was a positive that they felt that uh, it, it had a positive value. Population group awareness. Um, so th this is where we assessed their knowledge, their, their familiarity with the root populations provided in the, uh, in the ancestry results. Um, what we found broadly was they had a generally good idea of of the root populations, and you can see we assessed whether they had uh, whether they fully indicated the correct area, whether there was partial, so they didn't include any incorrect areas, but partial with no errors, partial with errors, and then fully incorrect. We didn't get any fully incorrect, 
but we saw some partial no errors. So, for example, uh, if they were looking at the European area, they would exclude areas that they, they might only include parts of, of uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, where we found the detectives um, had less familiarity was with Oceania and with the Asian root populations. And I think that this, these results, and in speaking to the detectives in the workshop, these are the results that really reinforce the need for that trained forensic biologist to provide this, uh, the MPS intelligence to the detectives who have limited familiarity with it and to coach them through the process of how it can be used. Offender include, exclude. So we found that there was across the four cases, there was only one instance uh, where one of the detectives excluded the offender. The exclusion was based on ancestry alone. Uh, and when we looked into that decision-making process, we found that that detective, uh, for case four, there was a group of four POIs who had the same ancestry and the same phenotypes, the same externally visible characteristics. And the detective used the intelligence to include two of those persons and exclude two. So it was a bit hard to understand the decision-making process that was used. And that's why I say it, that's an example <clears throat> where that decision would be avoidable uh, with uh, uh, the forensic scientist assisting. The POI exclusion rate. So, uh, Overall, averaged across the cases, we had about a 30% exclusion rate. So, and I think that this, um, sorry, I should say that that assessment was based on the overall assessment that we asked them to make. So for each, for each POI, we asked the uh, detectives to make individual assessments of whether they could include or exclude based on hair, eye and ancestry. And then we asked them to make a fourth assessment overall, taking into account each of those elements what would they what would their final decision be so they may include on hair and eye exclude on ancestry but their overall assessment may be to include so that poi exclusion rate we saw about a 30 percent exclusion rate and that really reinforced the uh, utility of the mps to um, prioritize large lists of POIs. So at the start of an investigation where there's uh, an unknown offender, a big list of POIs, then this could be one of the tools that the detectives could use to uh, start prioritising that POI list. So the findings, I guess in summary, um, the confidence and value assessments really demonstrated that the detectives felt that the MPS intelligence had utility and they were willing to use it. Um, again, I stress that they didn't have prior experience with it. So the fact that they, they saw value in it with limited exposure, I thought was very promising. There was only one offender exclusion. Um, and I said, this was a critical metric, whether the offender was excluded, uh, because obviously if we exclude the offender, um, then that's very misleading for the investigation. Um, and that was that exclusion was non-intuitive. So that really reinforced the need for the trained forensic biologist to deliver uh, interpreted NPS results to the to the detectives and not not just provide the raw results to them. The the thirty percent POI exclusion rate really demonstrated the effectiveness for cases with a large suspect pool, or possibly if mass screenings are proposed. Um, it really demonstrates that. Um, the potential to uh, prioritise those uh, suspect lists to cut down on the investigative hours and to accelerate an investigation. And as I've said a couple of times, it, all of the results highlighted that need for the forensic biologist to interpret and deliver that intelligence to the detectives. So the outcome, um, we assess the MPS uh, as being operationally effective and we used those findings in a, in a successful business case. And we were lucky enough to be able to purchase our own MPS instruments, which you can see pictured there. And we're about to, <coughs> excuse me, we're about to commence the validation of those now. Uh, just some disclaimers, which you can consume in your own time. And I think we're holding questions to the end. <laughs> 